And good evening, everybody. Dr. Bill Tulo, Medical Director at Oculus, and welcome to the Oculus Clinical Webinar Series. Tonight, I'm very excited to have a good friend, Dr. Ken Maller, talk to us about Penicam based wave scleral lenses. Um, a little housekeeping before I introduce Ken. Uh, if you have questions tonight, please put your questions into the chat. We'll do our best to get to them um, at the end of the uh, presentation. And again, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Dr. Ken Maller has earned his doctorate from the Illinois College of Optometry and currently is in solo practice in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. His practice is devoted to orthokeratology, myopia management, as well as providing visual rehabilitation for irregular corneas. He's one of the foremost wave contact lens designers in the world and has authored the first wave contact lens designer certification program. Dr. Mallow lectures extensively on custom contact lens design as well as providing clinical consultation services. Dr. Mallow was also one of the first doctors to start using the Pentacam CSP or corneal scleral profile software, uh, including when it was first in beta over five years ago. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and a diplomate in the cornea contact lens and refractive technology section of the American Academy of Optometry, a fellow in the International Academy of Orthokeratology, a diplomate in the American Board of Optometry and a fellow of the Scleral Lens Society. With no further ado, Dr. Ken Maller, take it away. Thanks a lot, Bill. And uh, welcome to all of you that have uh, come out to attend tonight. Uh, we welcome you and thank you for um, checking into the uh, webinar tonight for pentacam based uh, wave scleral lenses. Uh, hopefully, uh, I'll be able to uh, give you a little bit more insight to some of the abilities that the Pentacam can do uh, in aiding you to get to a much um, better result quicker, more efficiently, uh, and of course, using the Wave software integrated with the Pentacam uh, to really uh, create some uh, wonderful magic in terms of lenses. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, if it wants to start, let's, there we go. All right, just a little housekeeping. I do consult both for uh, Oculus and Wave. Uh, I am a solo private practitioner. My practice is a contact lens only practice in Fort Lauderdale, as Bill had said, uh, and it's uh, really centered around irregular corneas uh, and the any normal corneas are pretty much in orthokeratology. Uh, I do or have done the um, clinical support for Wave, uh, but I also, uh, do private uh, instruction for uh, WAVE users uh, now, and uh, that's through uh, my private consultation services that are available through uh, my website. I do uh, webinars and lectures for WAVE users. Uh, the private uh, consultation services uh, offer remote uh, fitting through case-by-case -case help or even one-on-one -on -one training through uh, phone and in person. Uh, to get uh, some WAVE doctors up to speed and getting their patients successful. Uh, I do beta testing for both the uh, WAVE uh, software uh, as well as the CSP software and also am uh, given some input on the AXL WAVE uh, Pentacam unit. Uh, I did author the first WAVE designers program for certification uh, and I'm currently guiding the WAVE training program also, I'm involved in a project now, uh, it's very exciting about um, artificial intelligence trying to assist in getting scleral lenses designed even more efficiently than we can do utilizing the power of both the uh, Pentacam and the Wave software. All right, so let's get to what we're gonna be talking about uh, today. For those of you who don't know what a Pentacam is, I just wanna go through the basics here. It is a rotating shine fluid uh, camera system. Uh, it does uh, provide us corneal topography and tomography. It gives us uh, imaging of the uh, entire anterior segment. And uh, it is possible also to get some axial measurement uh, uh, lengths as well as uh, total eye wavefront uh, aberrometry done uh, on the eyes. Uh, there are four platforms for the Pentacam, the basic AXL, HR, and AXL wave. Uh, they each have varying uh, abilities, uh, and you certainly can contact Oculus to find out the differences between the individual units. Uh, I will be talking primarily tonight about that last one, the EXL Wave, because that's the one that I'm using in my office. Okay, so Wave, what is Wave software all about? 
Well, WAVE is basically a CAD CAM program that's computer-aided design and computer-aided manufacturing, allowing a lens designer, which is you, uh, almost total control over every aspect uh, that uh, would uh, be in producing a uh, rigid lens. You can do it both from a theoretical surface, which most people don't really know. So you can create a uh, theoretical surface uh, based on E values uh, and curvatures, uh, or you can get the um, true surface uh, from the actual measured uh, data that's been taken off of the uh, patient's eye. Obviously, that's really where the power is, but the modeling from the theoretical surface allows you to experiment uh, and try uh, some different things without actually even ordering lenses. Or you can even take, take the uh, next step and order those lenses and see how they would actually perform on the eye. Um, you can, of course, create anything, uh, single vision, multifocal, corneal, sclerals, ortho K designs, all that's possible. Uh, but it's important to remember WAVE is not a lens design. WAVE is really just software. Uh, WAVE is an, a laboratory offering, so it's not like you call up and say, I want a WAVE lens. Uh, that doesn't mean anything. Uh, because it's not a lens design or something from the lab, there really isn't any predetermined uh, or fitting guide uh, as you are accustomed to with other uh, lens platforms. Uh, it is the most mature lens design software platform that's uh, on the market, uh, and I've been uh, involved with WAVE since 2000, so that's uh, 23 years now. Uh, it is most recently, in the last couple of years, been totally redesigned uh, with a much cleaner interface and improved design tools. And most of the new users are on the uh, newer software uh, because of that. So this is what the new software looks like. Uh, you can see in the upper half of that screen, uh, a um, graphic showing the blue arc, which is the lens design, on the uh, gray and white arc right below it, which is the measured data that was taken from this particular patient's eye. You can see it's a bit irregular. That's in fact the uh, keratoconic eye. Uh, in the left-hand side, there are graphical maps to give you information uh, that is relevant to your design so you can understand what it is you're designing. In the lower half of the screen, you can see a tier layer profile underneath the lens design relating the lens design to that corneal and or scleral surface, if it happens to be a scleral. Uh, and then there's some additional information, uh, both on the left and right hand sides of the uh, screen, uh, describing um, uh, some of the parameters uh, that would be a sort of a quick snapshot of what type of lens you're designing. For the shine flug images, you can take a look here, and this is what Penicam does provide. Uh, this is that uh, eye that you just saw on the uh, screen. It is a keratoconic eye. Uh, you can see in the upper shine flug image there, the uh, incredible thinning of that uh, almost at the very apex. It's just a little bit to the side of that dotted line. Um, and then on the lower one, uh, this is actually a recovering high drops that happened in the other eye on this particular patient, and that's where that white scarred area is in the central portion of the uh, arc. Okay, let's move on. Of course, the Penicam can display these uh, digital data displays in color, which we're all very accustomed to seeing. Uh, on this particular uh, display, you can see that we also have some data, in this case showing that the thinnest point on this right cornea is 248 microns thick. On the left eye, we have a 260 micron uh, thinnest portion of that particular cornea. We also have the Bell and Ambrosio enhanced ectasia display, or the bad display, as we uh, refer to it as. Uh, I'm not going to go through the specifics of what those pictures are on the left, but suffice it to say, those pictures are a way to enhance anything that seems to be out of the ordinary and makes it stand out much more obvious. So it's a very, very easy, quick glance. Is this a keratoconic cornea or is there something unusual going on with this cornea? Uh, in the upper right or the center, Right, there's some um, uh, 
uh, digital data. Uh, those are the actual numeric values. And of course, things that are in red are abnormal. Uh, and then, of course, down at the bottom, there are two graphs there, the corneal thickness spatial uh, profiling, which has the three gray arcs going from center to edge, uh, which are showing the middle gray line as the average with two standard deviations, one above and one below. Uh, and you can see the red uh, line above that, uh, which is this particular patient showing that his cornea is considerably thinner than would be considered uh, normal. Uh, the lower graph, the percentage thickness increase, uh, takes a look at the data analyzing how the cornea changes in thickness from the center to the edge. And again, once once again, you have those gray, uh, three gray arcs that are dotted. Those would be the average with the two standard deviations of a normal population. And once again, you can see this patient is clearly not anywhere near uh, normal. On the left eye, we can see much the same on this particular eye. Uh, it's very irregular, both on the um, uh, colorful displays on the left, as well as the uh, graphs that were in the lower right-hand portion of this uh, uh, display. All right, so one of the other displays that I find incredibly helpful is the Bell and ABCD progression display. Uh, and the reason this is so helpful is that Penicam does really all of the work for you uh, by pulling out the um, examinations that have been done over time and essentially will display them um, uh, next to each other so that you can see what things have progressed from the last time you saw the patient or even further back than the last time. Uh, and there are four parameters to that, the ABCD. The A refers to the anterior radius of curvature. And what it does is it takes a look at the uh, three millimeter curve, or I'm sorry, zone that's around the thinnest portion of the cornea, since that's the place where the most deviation seems to be happening. The B is the posterior radius of curvature. Again, looking at that same location, uh, the average curvature in that three millimeter zone centered on that thinnest portion of the cornea. The C is pachymetry values, and it does take a look at the thinnest pachymetry of the cornea in microns. Uh, and again, you don't have to go searching for it. Penicam finds that on its own and displays it off immediately. Now the D value has to do with the uh, best corrected uh, distance visual acuity, uh, and that's not uh, being measured by the Pentacam, uh, but you would go ahead and enter that manually. Once it's entered manually, it would be stored with that particular exam, so you can see how that is changing over time as well. This is what the uh, progression display looks like, and there's a lot of information on this, so I just want to give you a quick breakdown on this so you can see what's really going on here. Um, First, I have both the right and the left eye displayed with the uh, right historical data on the left side of the screen and the left historical data on the right side of the screen. All those colorful horizontal bars represent different examination dates that were done. Uh, I did not go back and assign any of these. All I did was ask Pentacam to bring up this screen. It went through the database of collected data from this particular patient and display these automatically. You can remove any of those if you don't really need to see them, uh, but I just put them all here uh, so that you can see exactly how, uh, without any input from you, this can be generated. You can see that the exam uh, on 112118, which is in sort of that golden color bar, is the one that starts at the top. And the very last one was on six, uh, June 7th of 2023, and that's that pink one that's in the bottom of the grouping. You can see it displayed on the ABCD uh, sections, the A being that anterior surface uh, curvature, uh, radius of curvature, the B being the posterior radius of curvature, C being the thinnest location, and the D bars, that one actually, I didn't enter the data, so those are not displaying any data at all. But if you did enter that, this would be displayed here as well. Now there's also those uh, flag posts that you can see there, both the red and the green ones. Uh, the green flag posts are referring to uh, a, a confidence interval 
of what you could say is normal uh, with 80 to 95% uh, assuredness. Uh, that's between those two flags. Uh, and then the red flags are taking a look at an 80% and 95% assuredness of you have keratoconus here. And of course, there's going to be just a little bit of overlap uh, in the uh, higher end of the normal and the lower end of the keratoconic cornea. Um, but when you take a look at the flags, that's giving you the location of where the bars should be, the horizontal bar should be lining up uh, to give you an idea if you're dealing with keratoconus. Now, on this right eye, you can see from 2018's exam through the 2023, everything has moved further to the right. Uh, so, in essence, the anterior radius of curvature has changed more, uh, indicating more assuredness that we have keratoconus. The posterior radius of curvature has also changed, everything continuing to move to the right as well. Uh, and the thinnest location, you can see the cornea has gotten continually thinner. On the actual bars, you can see the values there. They have gone from 317 microns in 2018 for the thinnest location down to 248 microns uh, earlier this year uh, in June. On the left eye, uh, there are more data points there or more bars there because of the high drops adventure that happened in uh, 2022 to 2023. So you can see there's a lot more there. But interestingly enough, you'll notice that the bars moving to the right have been essentially fairly static. And so the right eye has indicated a fair amount of progression while the left eye really has not. The left eye is definitely much more advanced in terms of the keratoconus, uh, but the right eye uh, actually has a thinner location and it's continuing to get thinner. Uh, this particular patient really relies on his right eye much more so than his left eye. Uh, the high drops adventure on his left eye didn't really bother him much because he just went without the lens and he can get by on his right eye, the, the, right, the right eye's vision with the lens on alone. Uh, but if anything happened to his left eye, that would uh, his right eye, that would be a much, much more um, uh, problematic issue for him to uh, function on a day-to-day -day basis. All right, so let's move on. Here's case one. So what about fitting lenses from all of this wonderful data? Well, we have a 56-year-old female, and she had a history of bilateral RK surgery back in 1994, uh, only one time in each eye. And she had a history of retinal detachment in the left eye with a scleral buckle in 93. That was the year before. She also has glaucoma. Uh, she's on Travitin, OD and OS uh, each day. Current spectacles are minus seven, minus one axis 91 and a minus 450, minus 250 axis 86. And you can see the acuity is abysmal at 2200. Uh, I went ahead and refracted her and I was able to get the right eye to 2100, but the left eye was really no better. And you could see the refraction really is all over the place. She's wearing a contact lens, a pair of soft lenses. The right eye I was able to identify as a biofinity toric, the minus 10, minus 275 axis 80, but the left eye had no idea what soft lens that was. The patient self-referred for ortho okay, though, because she noticed that her best corrected vision is poor and getting worse. The soft lens RX has been increasing over the past couple of years. She did a little research and found out that that might be something called progressive myopia and was interested in doing orthokeratology to see if we can slow down the progression of myopia and maybe give her back some vision. Uh, clearly from this history, you could see that was not on the top of my list, uh, but Anyway, we still do have to address since that was her chief complaint. At 56 year old, old female though, uh, the overwhelming question I had immediately is number one, why is the acuity so bad? And number two, if she had RK surgery, why is she so myopic? I will tell you uh, at the uh, bio microscope that day, I didn't see any RK scars. So I was kind of suspect that this was not an RK but actually a PRK that she had had, and she just didn't know really which surgery she had. Uh, she also was very unhappy with the ophthalmologist that was currently taking care of her, and so that's how she ended up coming to see me. So let's take a look at a summary of what we, what we have questions about on this case. So why is this post-PRK patient 
this myopic. It's very, very high, and that seems a little bit unusual. Uh, why is she reporting that her minus is progressing? And she's identifying this because the soft lens minus number keeps going up from the ophthalmologist that was taking care of us. So she was concerned as to why this is progressing higher and higher. Uh, she also has noticed that her vision is decreasing. So the question now is, is it glaucoma uh, that is killing off the nerve? Uh, does she have a cataract perhaps? Uh, or is it the irregular corneas from the PRK? So we have a bit of a conundrum to try and figure out where is the problem coming from that's causing the decreasing vision. Um, what's the potential for improved vision? Well, there's a lot on the table here. Um, and let's not forget her chief presenting complaint was she wanted to control myopic progression and was interested in orthokeratology. So is that even an option? Again, that was not sort of on the top of my priority list, but you can't ignore that since that's what uh, did bring the patient in. So I went ahead and did a uh, corneal scleral profiling pro capture. Uh, this is what it looks like on the uh, CSP software from the Pentacam. The arcs on the left are the individual cross sections. Uh, and on the right, you can see, lower right, you can see the Scheinflug images uh, of, the, um, of this particular eye that we were uh, measuring. Here's the uh, left eye. And when we take a look at the color, color data display of this, you can see my tangential curvature map. I always like to take a look at that. That's not looking particularly awful, given that this is a post-PRKI. Elevation map was actually fairly regular. Uh, corneal thickness, of course, it's a little bit thinner than uh, we would expect for uh, normal cornea, but she has had a corneal thinning procedure. Uh, and the back surface really doesn't look all that irregular either. This is on the right eye. Remember, it was best corrected to about 2100. And then here's the left eye. And you can see the left eye is a little bit sloppier in terms of its curvature uh, and the elevation. It's not quite as clean looking. It is a little bit thinner. Um, and again, the back surface is a little bit more irregular. So this may be accounting for that 2200 best corrected acuity. Over here, though, I've put on the top the right and left eye tangential curvatures. And then on the bottom, I've gone ahead and put the axial curvatures because that typically relates to uh, vision quality. And my gut feeling looking at these axial curvature maps is those don't look like 2100 or 2200 corneas. And there's a little bit of irregularity there. And if you told me it was reduced 24 to 2050, I'd have no trouble believing that. But 2100, 2200, I suspected that there was more going on than just the irregularity from these uh, corneal refractive surgical procedure that was done. So we went ahead and did aberrometry on her, and that's the whole eye aberrometry uh, taken at the Pentacam. The patient's pupil is almost six millimeters, and the refraction at three millimeters is, um, is better than minus 12, with a, a one and a half cylinder. Uh, and then the refraction at almost the patient's pupil at 5.5, is only about minus seven uh, with some with a little bit of cylinders. So that's a lot of discrepancy between the refractive status of this eye, which you would expect on a post myopic refractively uh, altered uh, cornea. The HOAs are very high. Uh, I've given you the normal ranges there at uh, four millimeters. It's about 0.15, and it's about three times higher at a six millimeter range. You can see at the 5.5 that this was measured at, she's at almost two microns of HOA. So she's really, really uh, got an enormous amount of uh, high order aberrations. And looking at that bar graph on the uh, top there, you can see that it's most likely a spherical aberration. And when we take a look at the number, we can see that the spherical aberration really is accounting for a great deal, which also accounts for the nearly six diopter difference between the three millimeter and 5.5 millimeter, uh, 5.5 millimeter, millimeter uh, zones. Uh, you can see again, 1.6 is way above where we would consider normal ranges. Uh, she does have a little bit of coma as well. Uh, and again, that's a very, very high uh, number uh, compared to the normal ranges. So that's the right eye. On the left eye, we have here, a pupil that was measured on the patient at 5.68, uh, 
Uh, and the refraction at three is about eight and a half with three and a half dobs as a cylinder. Uh, and at 5.5, we're at about minus six with about three dobs as a cylinder. So not nearly as much myopia on the left eye, as well as not as much change in myopia across the dimension of this cornea. So we would expect the uh, HOAs to be a little lower, and they are. You can see this went from 1.9 on the right eye down to 1.2, which is still very abnormal. Um, and the spherical aberration is considerably lower as well. Uh, we're down under one. Again, this is still a high number, but it's much closer to a normal range. Coma here is again, fairly high. And so she does have some irregularity here, but we also have a question mark now, given that I was able to correct the right eye a little better than 2200 down to 2100 yet the left eye seems to have a little bit more normalcy to the cornea than the right eye is so let's take a look at the retro illumination that's provided through the uh, pentacam exam as well so on this right eye you can see the retro illumination uh, there on the right and if you're not accustomed to seeing these images basically the brighter this image the more normal the lens is functioning. And so you can see this lens here has a couple of those little black spots uh, and some darker areas there. And so that's not really a pristine lens. And so we probably have some role of a cataract interfering with uh, this particular patient's vision on the right eye. And then when we take a look at the left eye, you can see it's even a little bit worse. So the cataract here seems to be a little bit worse on the left eye than the right eye, which does go along with the fact that she was best corrected to 2200 on the left eye, uh, but I was able to do a little bit better on the right eye. Again, arguing for the fact that the corneal irregularities are probably not the main player here. Uh, this, this, uh, these lenticular changes are probably playing a little bit more of a role uh, in diminishing the quality of the vision. Axial length measurements were done here as well. And you can see on the right eye, she's got an enormous eye at 27 and a half millimeters long. And the left eye also 27, almost 28 millimeters long. If you'll remember, the left eye is the one that had the retinal detachment. So we go along with the fact that it is, it is the longer eye. Uh, that certainly doesn't mean the right eye is out of the woods in terms of risk. Uh, but clearly she has some very, very uh, long eyes here. So to summarize what we found out here is the refraction and the aberrometry confirm that she really is, has myopia. The high myopia is confirmed and perhaps maybe because of that large axial length measurement, maybe that's really where all that high, mo high myopia has come back into play for her. Progression of the minus, I don't know, is it due to the unstable PRK cornea or the cataract? Well, right now I'm leaning more toward the cataract based on the information that I was able to pick up uh, through the uh, Pentacam measurements. Uh, decreased vision secondary to, well, we have an unstable PRK cornea. That's certainly a possibility. Again, I don't think that that's the main player. Uh, glaucoma, certainly that is a possibility. Um, or the cataract. And again, the cataract seems to go along with the best corrected uh, vision that I was able to get. So I'm voting for the cataract as being one of the main players here. So the potential for the improvement of her vision is really dependent on getting rid of the corneal irregularities. That's the enormous amount of spherical aberration on the right eye and a little less so on the left eye and certainly a fair amount of coma on both eyes. Uh, role of the cataracts. Again, I think those are playing a significant role. Role of glaucomatous nerve damage. Didn't really do any glaucoma work up here because I typically do not do that. Uh, anyone who has glaucoma in my chair is out of my chair and goes to someone who likes to deal with glaucoma. Uh, so I didn't really do a workup for glaucoma. Uh, and then of course we did have a history of a retinal detachment on the left eye. So it is possible that retinal damage is playing a role in keeping the vision from uh, improving on that left eye. So I had a very lengthy talk with her about how she wanted to proceed and what my gut feelings were on this. And she said she really would like to see if she can get some better contact lenses than the soft lenses that she's wearing now. So I went ahead and designed up pair wave scleral lenses. And you can see here, this is the right lens. I've given you the horizontal cross section on the top and the vertical cross section on the bottom, just so you can get a sense of uh, 
how this lens actually is going to look on this eye. And some of my design choices here, I picked a 15.6 millimeter lens. It, it is a free form design. Uh, the sagittal depth at the uh, extremes are varying from 3,356 microns to 4,245 microns. Or said in English, the portion of the lens that has the least sag is nearly a millimeter higher off of this eye than the one that has the deepest sag. Uh, I created single vision lenses. Uh, and you see, I did put the high minus power there of minus 12. Uh, and for the left eye, once again, the horizontal and vertical cross sections of what I had designed. My design choice is here. Again, a 15.6 millimeter diameter that's in a free form uh, design and symmetry. Uh, the SAGs here, you can see it's 3282 to 4257 of microns. Uh, that's a millimeter difference. So we do have a fair amount of irregularity uh, here. And if you take a look at the upper screen, the wave screen there, you can see on the nasal side, the value at 3337 uh, sagittal depth there, which is considerably higher than the temporal side, which is at 4090. And you can even visualize that on the screen. You can see how much deeper the lens is on the temporal side than the nasal side. Uh, again, a single vision lens, and I put a power of about minus 11 in there uh, for her. And our results, full day comfortable wear, best corrected contact lens acuity, 2040 in the right and 2040 in the left. So we did quite nicely on the acuity. Bio microscope, the uh, right and left eye were both well centered. The flange was well aligned, 360 degrees around, and we had about 150 microns of apical clearance in both of those uh, lenses. So I discussed with her those results. I referred her for bilateral cataract surgery because she was interested in getting even a little bit better vision than a 2040. Um, she had the cataract surgery, but then moved out of state and I lost her to follow up. So I don't know how she's doing now, but my understanding by way of phone was that after the cataract surgery, she was actually very, very happy with the quality of her vision. And so we see, even at the beginning of this, before I even designed up a scleral lens, I did have that conversation that I, my gut feeling from all of the data that I was able to collect clinically, that the cataracts were the main player here. And clearly that did turn out to be the case. Okay, let's go on to the second case. This is a keratoconic uh, patient and she's 53 year old female. Uh, that keratoconus diagnosis was only done at 50 years of age and it was done by me. And I do find it amazing that she made it to be 50 years old before receiving her first diagnosis of keratoconus. It's amazing that that was missed, uh, you know, all those years prior. Uh, and my gut feeling at the time that when I diagnosed it, I said, well, maybe it's very, very uh, minimally irregular. And that's why it had been missed all of those years. Anyhow, she came in at that point and I had fit her for a distance only uh, pair of sclerals. Well, she's a court clerk and she does an extensive amount of near work and computer work. So when she was in for annual exam this particular year, we were talking about replacing the lenses and she asked me if she could get a pair of scleral lenses that would decrease the dependency on the reading glasses that she'd been using for the past three years. So here's her uh, Scheinflug images. And you can see this is not nearly um, as irregular as that very first keratoconic shine fluid that I showed you. Uh, but we still can see that there's a fair amount of irregularity here. On the display, uh, you can see this is certainly not a minimal amount of irregularity. And it is amazing that she was able to get through 50 years of her life with no one picking up on the fact that this was keratoconus. Uh, you can see the axial maps down below. The irregularity is well into the visual axis and distorting her vision. Um, that really is astounding to me that she was able to get by with a pair of glasses uh, with that much irregularity present. So here's my wave lens design. And once again, I've put the horizontal cross section on the top and the vertical cross section on the bottom. And my choices on her were a 15, six millimeter diameter lens, again, in free form design. Uh, sagittal depth differences at the extremes were 3970 to 4673, so not nearly as dramatic uh, as I needed to do on that uh, previous patient. 
Uh, but we still have about you know about 700 microns of uh, difference between one side uh, versus the uh, other side. Uh, and this one I designed up a center near multifocal. On the left eye, once again the horizontal cross section on the top and the vertical cross section on the bottom. My choices here were a 15 7 millimeter diameter, free form again. Uh, sagittal depth, a little bit uh, larger difference between the extremes on this one uh, at what about uh, eight, eight to 900 microns of difference there. And again, a center near multifocal. And our results. Full day comfortable wear with satisfactory distance and near vision. She didn't need the reading glasses any longer. The distance corrected uh, lens vision here was 2025 minus, but with an OR, she was able to get to 2020. And on the left eye, 2030 minus, and again, with an, uh, an over refraction, she can get down to 2020 minus. And you can see it's not very much minus, just a little bit, and that's the multifocal interfering a little bit with the distance. However, both eyes open OU, she was really on the 2020 line with a little bit of a struggle. And considering how much near work she uh, had to do, she was actually very, very happy with these results. Um, I did have a uh, multifocal on prior to this final pair uh, that had the distance of 2015 in the right eye in 2020 at, on the left eye, but the near was not good enough for her. So I had to bias things a little bit more for near. Uh, and at that, at, you know, at doing that, I ended up compromising the distance just slightly, uh, but she was very satisfied with that. Um, she was very, very happy with her near vision. She was a 2020 equivalent. Uh, monocularly, in fact. Uh, the fit of the lenses were uh, well-centered. The good flange alignment, again, 360 degrees. We had apical clearance about 125 microns on each. And she was incredibly satisfied all day long because she didn't need any reading glasses. I went ahead and prescribed out a minus one uh, spectacle on the right and a minus 75 spectacle on the left. Uh, and upon follow-up, she never even bothered filling that because she was thrilled with the distance vision satisfied plenty. And so she didn't even feel she needed the uh, glasses for that. So in conclusion, we have uh, the Pentacam and it provides uh, excellent source topography to design software driven lenses. In this particular case, I used Wave, but it is compatible with uh, some other software platforms. Uh, the Pentacam captures that data over a much greater cord that's possible with Placido Disk. And additionally, the CSP Pro allows you to really to get out um, for all the scleral profilometry. Uh, on the uh, CSP Pro, uh, 18 millimeters is actually fairly simple to get uh, covered. Uh, and if you have an eye that can open wide enough, you can even do it in one capture that takes all of about two to three seconds. The Pentacam directly measures the true corneal elevation data, so it's not derived from the tear film reflecting data. Um, and as a result of that, the tear film quality isn't an issue for getting uh, data off the eye. Uh, many more corneal metrics are captured during the Pentacam scan than just anterior surface topography, and so that can aid in things such as identifying early keratoconus, uh, as well as you saw some of the other applications that I uh, use it for in these, uh, these two cases here today. Um, information like the total eye aberrometry, axial length measurements, densitometry, which we didn't cover today, uh, retroillumination, uh, that you all, um, that you are capable of getting during the Pentacam scans, uh, really can help you unravel the source and relative contributing values of some of the clinical unknowns, which can aid you in the clinical decision-making process. And that's how you saw, I was able to really determine that the cataracts were really the most likely in that first case, causing the greatest portion of the vision loss. But again, the lenses did do a fantastic job of cleaning up a lot of the um, irregularity that was uh, contained within those HOAs. And then for WAVE, WAVE provides you a patient unique reference surface, and then you can uh, construct that directly from the captured data. Uh, like I said, you can do it from a theoretical surface, but it certainly is, works much better and more efficiently if you can capture good data off the actual patient's eye. Uh, WAVE provides you displays and tools so that you can analyze and really apply your designer specific fitting philosophy to align the posterior lens surface any way you see is appropriate uh, with the anterior cornea scleral surface in a rotationally 
asymmetric manner. And then WAVE takes care of the um, complex anterior surface optical calculations by uh, creating something called a toric optics to compensate for what you just did to the back surface on, on the uh, lens design you did so that it will fit the eye properly. And with that, we are done for tonight and I'm welcoming questions. Hopefully you guys have some good ones. Uh, great cases, Ken. Uh, yeah, we do have a few questions for you. Um, let's start off with our first question and it's regarding case number one um, and probably can apply to case number two also. A little bit about your edge design. So what is your target limbal and edge clearance on a scleral lens design? Um, it seems like on the edge on a case one that it appears that it was much higher than the default in wave. So that's something obviously you consciously changed. Can you tell us a little bit about your thought process? Sure, absolutely. Uh, well, first, let me go on the record here that I, I never, ever, ever dispense a default lens. So I, I believe in uh, bringing my knowledge base to the table when I'm designing up a lens design. Uh, and I will uh, typically uh, bring the experience that I've uh, accumulated over uh, ne nearly a quarter of a century working with WAVE and these asymmetric lenses so that I can get a lens that's going to be as close to perfect as possible on the first shot out. As far as um, edge, uh, for scleral lenses, edge and limbal clearances and angles, uh, I really rely very, very heavily on trying to get the lens into what I would refer to as accepted normative ranges uh, based on historical data that's been collected uh, on scleral shape, uh, as well as what I measure on the uh, patient's eye directly. Uh, so for example, uh, if I measure something directly on the eye that has a scleral angle uh, that says it's, let's say, 47 degrees, and I know that if based, based on normative data that's been collected over many, many eyes that have been examined over the years, that no one has scleral angles that are that steep, uh, I'm probably going to temper what I do with the edge profile despite what I might see on the screen. Uh, that will also be possibly massaged by the fact that I may have noticed I had a little more trouble capturing data on a particular eye, and the data may be, uh, how shall I say, maybe just a little less trustworthy in terms of generating up a reference surface, and so I might rely a little bit more heavily on a knowledge base rather than the direct measurement. If I, however, felt that I really got a great measurement, no, I might actually go more toward exactly what I've measured. So typical angles for edges are somewhere in the 35 to 40 degree range, very typically. And again, that's a very broad stroke default area. I, I certainly deviate from that on a regular basis, but that's a good place to start. And in terms of limbal clearance, um, it's very hard to predict how much the lens is going to settle. Uh, once it's sitting onto the uh, conjunctiva. And so typically on a first lens design, I'll usually aim on my wave screen to have a limbal clearance somewhere around 100 microns. Uh, clinically, I'll find that that typically will end up somewhere around 50 microns, maybe, maybe a little bit more. Uh, but again, that is a little bit variable based on uh, the sort of the sinking of the lens into the conjunctiva. So then I might need to um, alter that as I would redesign the second lens, should that be necessary. Ken, speaking of the variability in lens settling, how does that go to, um, do you change the default uh, central clearance? Um, do you go more than 350? Do you go less than 350? Or what is your, what do you do with central clearance? Abs absolutely, Bill. Uh, what I found on the wave screen and Again, this is following the philosophy of how I design the lens. So if you design the lens differently, your syncing may be different. So this, this is normative data based on what I typically do. And I noticed when I first started designing up the wave lenses and I would see, for example, 350 microns of apical clearance on the wave screen, I would invariably end up with a lens that was too close to the cornea. Uh, somewhere around 50 to 75 microns. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really like that. And so 
Where I am now is typically about 400 and a quarter to 450 microns of central clearance on my first wave of lens design. And what I do find is that that typically will leave the lens somewhere between 100 and 150 microns of settled uh, location uh, apically uh, once it's actually on that eye. So that seems to be a pretty good starting point for my design philosophy. You may design it a little differently and you may find that you're ending up with very different results than I am, but that, that's what works for me. So, the, and does that rationale differ if it's in a regular cornea or a normal cornea? Uh, the only time I really get concerned uh, is uh, on these uh, grafts, uh, because grafts I get concerned about oxygen and the like, and I may, I may be a little bit more uh, prone to air on the side of a little less clearance apically to make certain that we're not going to uh, end up with any oxygen deprivation to the graft. Um, other than that, possibly the RK corneas would fall into that um, category as well. Uh, but other than the, the oxygen issues, no, I don't really deviate much on the irregularity, no matter how irregular the cornea is. On case number one, Ken, your calculation of the power of the lens, did you utilize your manifest refraction, the aberrometry refraction, or trial lens? How did you, how did you calculate the power? Yes. <laughs> when, 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 when you have these very irregular corneas, uh, you, you know, I, I took a look at the original soft lens power. I took a look at my manifest refraction data. I took a look at the aberrometry, and I made my best guess for where the first RX needed to be. Uh, they really are very, very challenging. Uh, and unless you're going to put a, a diagnostic lens on to get your power uh, that would get you a little bit closer, you still are going to really expect to be hopefully in the ballpark, but not likely on target with your first power choice uh, for your lens. Um, I've done away with um, trial lens fitting. I, I haven't had a trial lens on a patient. It's, 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 it's more than 15 years. Um, I, I really don't like to torture the patients with trial lens fitting, so I do it all empirically. Uh, and my feeling on that first lens is more than likely there's going to be something that I'm going to have to fine tune, whether it's something about an edge profile, maybe the apical clearance isn't going to be just enough or just the way I like it, or the limbal clearance isn't enough in one area or something like that. And then I use that really as my trial lens so that I can get the proper optics onto that lens for the second lens. Almost always I'm done by the second one, so. Excellent. Um, regarding diameter selection, I know these are just two cases and they both had sub 16 millimeter diameter. Do you have a nomogram that you use for your diameter selection? Do you use white to white or, or well, what do you do as far as diameter selection? Uh, excellent question. On the, on the uh, diameter selection, uh, if there's nothing unusual, so for example, a uh, pinguecula in the way, uh, very small apertures, uh, a patient who can't handle lenses, so we have to you know, make sure we keep them as small as possible. Assuming that, that there's nothing else other than I'm trying to deal with the eye, I found that the HVID, uh, which is not the white-to-white uh, -white measurement that the Pentacam reports, uh, but is typically a little bit smaller, but it is variable, um, and I have discussed that in another webinar as to how I actually measure the uh, HVID. But typically I will use the HVID and uh, add four to that for my first default lens. So in this case, I think we had a 15.6 millimeter lens. You can be assured I measured the HVID at 11.6 and that's where I got the 15.6 from. So that's a good starting point for me. Excellent, excellent. Um, does lid, uh, lid tightness play any factor as far as um, your uh, Pentacam measurements? Are you concerned about lid tightness or is it a non-factor for you? No, no, that lid tightness is really a non-factor. I don't, I don't really find that any issue. Uh, it doesn't interfere with uh, capturing the data. It doesn't interfere with the data that you've actually captured. Um, and, it's, and it's probably not gonna interfere very much with the lens itself. So uh, the laxity of the, li the lids or the tightness of the lids, I don't think really plays much in, in this particular sphere of, of uh, treatment, any particular role at all. I have one more question for you and it's about case number two. 
Um, yes. How did you go about deciding um, to not only do a near central design, and I think I know the answer to that, but how do you decide how what diameter the, the, that the near center design was, and was it related to pupil size, mesopic, photopic, or anything? Can you tell us a little bit about your thought process on the near center design and how you how you designed the diameter of it? Sure, absolutely. Um, that's an incredibly complex topic uh, because there are a lot of variables that will play into role there. Uh, but on a scleral lens, given that the lens is not going to move much, uh, you will really have a challenge getting near to work well in a centered distance type of design. And so as a default, almost immediately on any scleral design, I will choose a center near design which is exa the exact opposite if I'm designing a corneal lens. Corneal lenses are centered distance until proven they will fail. Uh, and, and sometimes I will go through a couple of iterations before that's proved to me that it's gonna fail. So on a scleral lens, because it doesn't move, uh, getting the centered distance uh, to work it near is very, very challenging. The center near works very, very well. Uh, but now it's a matter of you can't mess up the distance too much. And so you have to uh, be cognizant of how large the pupil size is and how much of that sort of bundle of light you're stealing for the near function. Because the more you steal for the near function, the more they complain that the distance doesn't work and they're thrilled about the near, but obviously it's about achieving a balance. Uh, what I found is on average pupil sizes, and again, what's average? Average. So somewhere around the, uh, let's, let's say somewhere around the three, five range or so uh, in um, a mesopic conditions, uh, I found that I'll typically start on wave at a pupil size of about 2.5 uh, for a center near design. Uh, interestingly enough, although the pupil size is selected at 2.5, the near starts turning into distance in more of a fashion like a progressive lens works. It starts progressing toward the distance considerably sooner than 2.5. So it is quite a bit smaller than that. It's devoted just to near. But the value on the wave screen is 2.5. And so that, that's a good place to start. And then tweaking up or down a little bit based on, uh, for example, eye dominance. Uh, I will take that into account as well. Um, on a um, uh, multifocal, the dominant eye will typically have the smaller pupil size, whereas the non-dominant eye will have the slightly larger pupil size. So for example, and I didn't happen to notice on this particular, uh, the second case there, but let's say her dominant, um, her dominant eye was her right eye. I might have chosen, for example, a 2.3 millimeter center near pupil on the right, whereas I chose a 2.5 uh, center near pupil on the left, uh, just to make certain we had enough for the distance on the right. So Ken, one of the things I've noticed is that you can't control centration of the scleral lenses easily. They often will decenter temporally, and oftentimes pupils are naturally decentered nasally. Um, do you often make changes to the location of the zone, or do you kind of leave that central? Well, that's one of the nice things on Wave. Uh, Wave gives you the ability to decenter the multifocal optics. So, if in fact you have a scleral that is decentering uh, temporal and down, which is typically where they will decenter, uh, you can go ahead and uh, move the multifocal zone so that it's better centered onto the um, onto the visual axis, so it doesn't disturb the distance nearly as much as as you would expect. Um, I, I honestly, though, work considerably harder to get the lens actually centered so I don't have to decenter the optics because that actually, that, that, it just complicates things even further, but it is possible to do that. And I have done that on some cases that are stubborn or on the other cases where the lens may actually be centered, but you have that large angle kappa and you just, you, the lens is right where it belongs, but the visual axis isn't. Mm -hmm. And so you, I'll move the visual axis of the, um, of the uh, multifocal, uh, or I'm sorry, I'm sorry, move the multifocal zone center more over where the visual axis is decentered due to the large angle kappa. 
Excellent, excellent answer. It's very helpful. Um, these things can get complicated, but uh, great information tonight, great cases. I thank you so much for your presentation. I thank everyone for joining tonight. If anyone has additional questions, my email is, you can see um, um, Ken, Ken Malik can be reached through me. Uh, my email is btulo, T-U-L-L-O, at oculususa.com. And again, thank you so much for joining tonight and have a great evening, everybody. Thanks, everyone. See you soon.